Okay, this is the sixth edition of our finance and investing class. Thanks so much for joining. I'm Martin Shkreli. I've uploaded all the relevant files to the share drive. If you don't know where that is, there'll be a bunch of links in the description box and message box as we speak. So anyway, let's get to it. Um, we've left off, maybe I'll do a quick review of kind of where we've been. Um, I just updated this thing, let's see. So I talked a little bit about my life and sort of where I came from and kind of the decisions that I've made in my personal kind of career. We talked about planning your career. We talked about teaching oneself and I actually went to my library and went through a few books. Um, there's an, an unending number of books on Warren Buffett, which I would encourage you to read or read all of them if you could. Snowball is the recent biography. I would certainly try to read that. My brother got me this for, for, uh, for uh, Christmas. Oh, it was last year. I think it was last year. And it's just the essays of Warren Buffett. Um, which I don't think are the letters themselves. They're, they're different essays. They're different essays. So you may want to read those. And I have a couple of other books. Uh, two great hedge fund managers, Julian Robertson and Michael Steinhardt. There are books about these guys that I don't think are they're I don't think they're great books. They're not going to win any literary prizes, but they're certainly um, not terrible to read if you want to learn more about great equities investors over the years. Those are two two of the great equities investors over the years. Anyway, um, we've talked about uh, so a little bit about how to learn on your own, which is extremely important. Uh, we did a quick overview of equities, actually wrote most of this, and I thought this was an interesting addition. I said that almost all corporate activity on the planet is done in the aim of creating new, of creating equity value. It's done in the aim of creating equity value. And whether that's through increased stock value or dividends, most people work for this concept of corporate activity, at least. And that goes from all big, huge public companies like Walmart and Google, all the way down to sole proprietorships like your local Quickie Mart. Uh, and why do we use equities? Um, why, why are they useful? Well, they allow for rapid business expansion because you can sell new equity, and equity is portable. It's very efficient. You can list, trade, and sell equity uh, quickly, as opposed to partnership interests or other forms of splitting a company up. Um, of course, new equity is dilutive to the old equity owners, but it does provide cash when you sell new equity. We've been through this a million times, the sort of six things I look at for any equity. We talked a little bit about um, the financial statements and enterprise value concept, which I encourage you to understand. We talked about accounting and some important concepts of accounting. We dove deep into the balance sheet and income statement. We started to do the cash flow statement. We'll do more and more of that. We've talked about discount rates talked about discounting cash flow. I did this sort of John is an NFL quarterback example that's often in textbooks. Um, we talked a little bit about bonds. Uh, I'll talk about bond equity parity someday. We started to do a little bit of fundamental research. We talked about your expectations when it comes to fundamental research. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about more about fundamental research and forecasting. Um, That and then I wanted to sort of introduce a new topic, which we'll go through briefly before we get back to a regularly scheduled programming. Um, and it's a sort of a new section, and I'll, I'll be doing these here and there. And we're going to call it markets and portfolios. And this is really a different concept from kind of what we've been learning. So I want to briefly go through kind of markets and portfolios. And the simplest thing to understand is that stocks are traded on stock exchanges, and stock exchanges are. are very distinct things, and in the U.S. we have several stock exchanges like the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange. But in the U.S., all of our exchanges are kind of sufficiently electronic and computerized that there, there is no real distinction between any of them that's practical and relevant. Uh, one thing that's very basic that's important to understand is this concept that uh, for every buyer there must be a seller. Uh, you can't just sell the stock into the market. There has to be a corresponding buyer. And a trade, that's called a trade when there's a seller and a buyer. A buyer who's bidding agrees with a seller on a price who is asking for a price. And so let's look at some of the trading basics. I copied and pasted this from Bloomberg. And you can see that 
if you look carefully here, you can see that there are all these bid prices. And the best bid is the guy who will buy the stock if someone wants to sell at the market price. The current bid is 200.55, and he's going to buy 7,700 shares. That's what that 77 means. So he's willing to buy 7,700 shares at $200 a share. How much money is that? Let's see. It's about a million and a half dollars. So there's somebody out there right now willing to buy one and a half million dollars of this stock called SPY. Uh, and correspondingly, there's someone willing to sell 6,700 shares at 200.6. And this is after, even after the market's closed. That's about a million and a half dollars that they're willing to sell. And that's after the market's closed. So this is a very liquid security. This is maybe the most liquid security there is. Uh, we talked about beta last time. This is a correlation coefficient to the market. It's sort of like an R squared value, if you're familiar with that in math. So all these are important to know. In fact, you should, you should know every single one of the little things listed on this sheet. And again, this has been uploaded to um, the share drive. Now let's talk about funds. Well, funds are, are things that fund managers create. And what they are is a collection of stocks. And we call that collection of stocks a portfolio. And fund managers create these portfolios or funds to outperform each other. That sounds a little, um, that sounds a little bit, um, I guess, competitive, and it is. You know, the, the, the goal is to have the best fund possible. Um, and these funds just basically try to get the best performance possible. They wanna buy the stocks that go up the most in any given year. There's two more or less general approaches to investing. You can either be a passive investor or an index investor. We'll talk about what an index is in a second. Or you can be an active investor. So a passive investor buys a predetermined portfolio of stocks uh, according to a list or a metric. For example, the S&P 500 is a list that is publicly available, and there are a lot of S&P 500 passive index funds. Russell Midcap Index. You know, uh, they they have a specific weighting for each uh, public company. There's no one sitting there saying I like this company more than that company. They just buy uh, these stocks relative to certain predetermined numbers. Now the, the rest of the investors out there are active managers and they attempt to create their securities portfolios based on their skill. Uh, this often goes wrong. Uh, most, of, most people cannot outperform the stock market and I believe there's a good reason for that which we'll talk about more in, in more advanced classes. Now there's all kinds of funds. There's some funds that can short, there's some funds that can invest in private securities, there are funds that list their, their fund shares publicly. There's private partnership funds. There's all kinds of funds. And there's mutual funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, private equity funds, just to name a few. There are many more than that. So how do you go about um, selecting a portfolio? Well, we spent a lot of time trying to value individual companies, and we'll continue to do that when we're done here. Um, but there's several different strategies. Um, one, for example, is this long versus short concept. And I think if you've watched these videos before, you understand that I'm a big fan of short selling. And I don't think that stocks go up over the long term, especially corrected for inflation uh, and other dynamics, uh, especially the sort of, I think, erroneous ways we calculate index fund returns. So we'll talk about that. I think it makes sense to neutralize the risk of beta. Stocks can go up for extended periods of time. For instance, we've been in a big uptrend. We've been in a big uptrend for many years now. You can see from 2008 to 2016, stocks have gone up. And you might see, you might ask yourself, how is that possible if there's a no arbitrage concept that we've talked about many times, that there can't be an arbitrage, there's no arbitrage. Why did the stock market track, in, in many ways, just sort of the trajectory of, of, uh, of the economy? Why did that happen? Well, this was no ordinary recession in 2008. A lot of people felt uh, a lot of fear in 08 that there would be some systematic crumbling of all of capitalism in our economy. That didn't happen, so we got quite a nice recovery. And I think that uh, just the passage of time has allowed earnings to reach record highs, and stocks have had to sort of catch up, if you will. Since stocks have been pretty uh, modestly valued for many uh, years, if not almost two decades, and if you actually calculate this rate of return, which we did the other day, it barely, if, if at all, beats inflation, which is really, I think, remarkable. So the last 20 years, stocks haven't beaten inflation uh, very well. 
So there's no free lunch, but there, there, there was a big correction in stock prices in 08 that one could have taken advantage of conceptually. And I think that if you just had long stocks, you'd be very happy from 08 to 2016. There's no way to tell in 2007 that we're about to go into a bear market. And of course, if you only had short stocks up here, you'd be very happy. Um, so my approach is to have both longs and shorts in equal amounts. I think there's a lot of misperceptions that shorts are riskier than longs, and I, I don't know that that's true. Um, so other, other portfolio managers, well, you know, it's certainly depending on the kind of fund you have. If you have a mutual fund, you can't even short stocks most of the time. If you have a hedge fund, you can short stocks, but a lot of hedge funds don't even do that. And certainly venture capital funds don't have any publicly traded stocks, nor do private equity funds. So a lot of these are very different based on the kind of fund you have. You, the universe you select on, that's the list of securities that we'll focus on. We're doing tech, uh, global public tech companies for our, our uh, purposes. But there's certainly different kinds of things you do, market cap focused, style focused, geography focused, and we're doing a sector focused, uh, uh, a very sector focused universe as of right now. So we, we have a few rules, and one of them is that most stocks are fairly valued. And that's a, sort of a take on what people call the efficient market hypothesis, which is that stocks are efficiently priced. All, all market, market uh, stocks in the stock market are efficiently priced because uh, there's so many observers looking at stocks that they're that they're uh, always reasonably priced. And I don't know that that's true. I think most people disagree with the efficient market hypothesis, but my take on it is that most stocks are actually fairly valued, um, most stocks. I think that for every 10 stocks you look at, eight of them will be fairly valued. Maybe one will be overvalued and one will be undervalued. Concentration versus diversification. This is something we kind of got cut off last time. A lot of people debate, it's been a debate that's that's gone on for decades, if not centuries, is how many stocks are optimal in a portfolio? Number of stocks. Another sort of key question is turnover. Should you be sell, buying and selling every day um, or every year or how often? How often? Um, maybe I can write that in here somewhere. Can turnover. We did universe somewhere else. Turnover and rate of return. Talk about that shortly. So anyway, with respect to the number of stocks, it's my opinion that you want as many as possible. And that's just a sort of a mathematical concept. Now the problem with this hypothesis is that we're only human. And ideally we'd, we'd, we'd study thousands of stocks and pick as many as we can to, to get diversification. We assume that there's gonna be there's gonna be some error in our ways. So let's say there's a thousand stocks. And again, according to my principle, let's say 800 will be fairly valued. So we're not gonna look at those 800. There's gonna be 200 that are not fairly valued, not fairly valued. 100 will be longs and 100 will be shorts. But we're not perfect, we're human. So we know, we know that we're gonna get something, some of these wrong. We're gonna be long there's a famous hedge fund manager right now who's his biggest long is I think called Valiant and he's been wrong. Well, he's long and wrong. Uh, Valiant has gone down a lot, uh, but it's his biggest long. And he's also had a short that's gone up quite a bit. I think it's called Herbalife. I don't know a lot about the situation, but I think that's what's happening. And so in any event, sometimes you get it wrong. And so there's some percentage chance that, that you, will, you will get it wrong. And, and that's why I think you wanna minimize that percentage chance at impacting you. For instance, if the percentage chance that you're gonna get something wrong is 60-40, which is pretty good. 60% of the time you're gonna be right, 40% you're gonna lose and be wrong, win, loss. Well, if you have six stocks that you're long, if you have six stocks that you're long, do you know what the probability is that even though you're pretty good because you're 60-40, what is the chance that you will get it wrong several times in a row? In fact, what is the chance that you'll get all six stocks wrong? I think it's 0.4 to the to the sixth power, if I'm not mistaken, and that's not an impossible, that's not an impossibly small number. It's pretty small. It's pretty small. It's less than less than one percent chance. But that means that you'd get every single one of them wrong, and I think that's that's somewhat intolerable, if, given that you have 60 percent chance. Now let's say, and remember, for every one you get wrong, you kind of cancel out one that you got right. So all you need to do to mess up your portfolio is have four winners, or let's say, let's say, yeah, three winners and three losers and you make no money. So at best, four winners and two losers is sort of the, 
you know, is, is in fact quite quite possible. In fact, it's sort of a, it's sort of almost likely. In fact, I think if you do the math right, there's a good chance. Uh, uh, I'm not doing my statistics very well here, but <laughs> there's a good chance. There's definitely a good chance that you're going to have a lot of things wrong. So you want to maximize the kind of spread by by maximizing the number of stocks in your long portfolio. And I'll I'll do the uh, I'll do the math someday. I can sort of conjure this idea on the fly. So let me. Let me go back and do the math on that whole thing. So in any event, you want to, um, you definitely want to have as many stocks as possible. The problem is most people are, this is a technical term you may not be familiar with, lazy. Most people don't want to look at a thousand stocks. Most people don't want to spend their weekends looking at stocks, their nights looking at stocks. Most people want to sit there and have a couple stocks and they don't want to research them day and night. And, and that's part of being a fund manager. They, many, there are many, in fact, most fund managers, I'd say, work very hard, but there are plenty that don't, and there are plenty that, that think they work hard and they don't as well. So I think that there's, um, you know, kind of this complacency and laziness that, that permeates the industry, most industries. That's why the people that work the hardest seem to do the best. So anyway, having 100 great long ideas and 100 great short ideas is a lot of work, but it's not impossible if you have a decent sized team. Now, having said that, there's some, there's some theory that in, when you concentrate your bets, you have a better chance of making more money. And I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure that's true. In fact, some of the highest returning funds are not concentrated at all. A good example from, from history were, were two hedge funds called Renaissance. Renaissance is still in business. And the other one is called Steinhardt. And these funds were notoriously diversified, notoriously diversified, and they made a lot of money. They, they'd have literally 100 to 1,000 positions at any given time. Then there's concentrated funds that have done very well as well. Concentrated funds. And um, I don't know if I can give a few examples, but Buffett's early days, he was concentrated. He's no longer very concentrated. Buff but Buffett's early portfolios were very concentrated. There's a mutual fund called Sequoia, which is very concentrated and has done very well. So there's plenty of people that have made money on both and lost money on both. You can be diversified and lose money as well. It's harder. It definitely is harder. And you can certainly be concentrated in one or two positions and get lucky and make money for a short period of time. So in any event, I believe in diversification with the understanding that there's a natural limitation to how much work one person or one team of people can do. So there's a lot of debates on that and we'll, we'll talk about that more and more over time. One of the things that you have to understand about investing that many people don't is you don't have to invest if you don't have good investment ideas. And I think this is actually what's wrong with hedge funds and, and mutual funds and other types of funds, that no one forces you to make a bet, or at least they shouldn't. Some investors and investment managers feel like they're forced. They actually feel like they have to come up with great new stock ideas all the time. And sometimes there just aren't any. There just aren't any. And you don't lose anything by not betting. Um, and there's a lot of great investors like Buffett and like uh, Seth Klarman and others who have done very well, who have done very well by, by just kind of waiting. So turnover, how fast should you, should you change the stocks in your portfolio? This is a great question. I get this question a lot. People say, how often do you want to hold a stock for? And I say, for as little time as possible. Why is that? Well, it's the sort of opportunity cost of money concept. If, if I buy a stock for $10 and I think it's worth $20, they say, well, well, how long do you want to hold that stock for? And the answer is, as little as possible. As fast as I can get a return, the better. If this is going to take five years, I can do the, the rate of return on that. Let's see, five years minus 10 plus 20. That's a 15% return. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. If it's going to take 10 years, well, that's a 7% return. That's not that exciting. What if it took... One year, well, that's a 100% return, right? How about half a year? Half a year would be better. That's a 300% rate of return. Now note, I'm not making 300%. This is a 100% return, but if they're making it in six months, and I, this is a 300% so-called IRR, internal rate of return. And that's an important concept that we're gonna go to, internal rate of return. And this, this is a really interesting concept. So let's say for long term, I think I'm gonna, it's gonna go from 10 to 20, and it's gonna take two years. 
two years. Let me do this math again. Now let's say that's a 41% rate of return, which would be amongst the best fund managers of all time. I like my stocks when they perform that way. But let's say, let's say I bought the stock at 10 and it was $12. It was $12 two weeks later. It was 52 weeks in a year, right? So that's 0 0.03 eighths years later. 0 0.03 eighths of a year later. Two weeks later. Right? Two weeks later. What's my rate of return? It's actually 12,000%. It's 12,000%. Now, there's never been a hedge fund that's made 12,000%. But the point is that I'd much rather buy and sell a stock in two weeks and make 20%. Let's see, the IRR is 20%, uh, is 12,000%. Is the actual cash return, we'll call it, is only 20%. I'd much rather get this than that. Does anyone know why? And the answer is not because the IRR is higher. What is it? What? But, but why exactly? And there is no great method for this. Some of it is, I think, pretty random. It's hard to know if a stock's going to go up in two weeks or two years. Sometimes you'll get most of the bang for the buck in, in a few months. It's a time value of money. I can always take my $12, I say this is millions of dollars, I took $10, $10 and made it 12, $10 million and made it $12 million. Well, now I can take that $12 million and find a new opportunity, potentially one similar to this one. And I'll be plenty happy uh, with the rate of return I made. Now, I may say I don't have any other opportunities. I'm going to hold on to this one. There's a lot of ways to think about it. And there's no easy answer. But again, as time approaches zero, it's very hard to know that you're getting anything but randomness. You know, if, again, if someone told you that they could predict using fundamental analysis, the, the only kind of legitimate analysis without quantitative analysis, which we'll talk about some other time, if someone could tell you that I, they thought that from, from uh, let's see, from two o'clock to three o'clock that the stock market would go down, I'd tell you that they were crazy. But that would be really fast, right? That wouldn't even be two weeks. That would be like one hour. So if you could consistently do that, even if the return is 1%, you would make such a fortune, it'd be crazy. And there are some people who are okay at this. They're, they don't get right 100% of the time, but maybe they get it 55% of the time. I'm not that kind of person. In fact, I'm not sure I believe in that. So there's very much randomness from the, from the hour to hour. Maybe if you, if you don't believe that, how about every 15 minutes? Do you really think the market moves in a predictable way every 15 minutes? Maybe if you have Renaissance's supercomputer and you know that people are buying or selling at any given point, maybe, but I doubt it. But as the time goes to infinity, you can really understand that companies like Coke, Coke, this is 20, 30 years, Coke stock has gone up quite a lot. As time stretches over long periods of time, maybe it is easier to understand whether a stock will go up or down. So anyway, those are a couple of thoughts, and I'll, I'll keep developing these for you as we, as we go on. And maybe what we'll do is we'll create a portfolio for ourselves, and we'll do that from the tech industry. So let's pick a tech stock um, that we can look at. How about Microsoft? How about Microsoft? What's Microsoft's stock price? That's the first, there's six things that I look at, right? The first thing is the stock price. Well, it's $51. 5103. All right, let's, let's make a new file. Always do the same method. It's good to have some repeatability in your methods. Go to my favorite website, SEC's website. SEC, here it is. I'm going to type in Microsoft's ticker, MSFT. There's the latest 10 Qs right here. It's interesting, they have a off fiscal year. So the Q4 is not the December quarter for Microsoft. Very interesting. Well, anyway, here's their balance sheet. And you can see immediately they have this mountain of cash. Let's see, investing class, Microsoft. All right. So they have, well, let's see. The first page of the 10Q tells us how many shares there are. There's 7.909 billion shares. And at one point, Bill Gates owned most of them. Bill Gates owned like a billion or two billion shares of Microsoft. Maybe he still does. Let's let's look on Bloomberg. Let's look on Bloomberg. 
Here he is. He owns 200 million shares of Microsoft. William Henry Gates III. That's about a, what is that, $10 billion roughly? I think there's other Microsoft shares he owns that aren't listed here. Anyway, it's, that's $404 billion, $7,949. That's the value of Microsoft or their market cap. How about cash? I spied some cash here. Let's see. Plus 785, plus 95, That's 100 billion right off the bat. There's equity and other investments of 11. Four, so that's 111 billion. 111 billion. How about debt? There's a bunch of debt. 4679. Securities lending payable. They must be short some stocks. That's pretty cool. I was one of the only people that ever disclosed securities lending payable because uh, most companies don't use their cash to short stocks. I'm a big believer that companies have to use their cash for investments, but that's a long, long, long story. All right. So the enterprise value is smaller than the market cap, which means they have net cash. Net cash is what, like 70 billion? So they have enough cash right now to go buy a bunch of companies, maybe like Yahoo. I think there's a lot of people thinking Microsoft will buy Yahoo, which I think would be a, probably a good idea. 15. All right, so we're going to link the Microsoft model on our tech page here. We're going to multiply this by 7909. Gives the market cap. And then we're going to put down the net cash. So you can see that adjusting for cash, the difference between Microsoft and Apple isn't that big. The companies are actually worth somewhat similar. One is 330, one is 420. It's pretty close in terms of the enterprise value. The, the market cap value is quite different. That's kind of interesting, I think. It's always fun to see stuff like that and know stuff like that. Anyway, let's take a look at Microsoft's actual business. Set up our model like we usually do. This only takes a GIF, and then we can we have it forever, which is always nice. So let's see. Here's the income statement. You can see their quarterly revenue of twenty-three point seven billion is smaller than most of the companies we've looked at. It's, it's, it's pretty similar to what IBM's, if I recall correctly. IBM had a little more. That's pretty similar to IBM's, 22 billion. But Microsoft has much higher margins, as you'll see soon. All right. So I want to be careful here because it says three, three months ended December 31st, 2015. So I'm actually just going to put down 12, 31, 15, even though I know it's not this quarter. Maybe it's this quarter. Let's guess. 3796, 9872, the gross margin, the gross profit. Let's see what the gross margin is. Is that about it's a little lower than I thought? It used to be very, very high, but I think because they sell Xbox and other Surface and stuff like that, their margins are lower than they've ever been. All right, what else? Research and development. Microsoft has always spent a fortune in research, and it's never really been productive. It doesn't make any sense to me. General administrative, sales and marketing, research and development. Microsoft spends so much money in research and development, they almost never have anything to show for it. Sales and marketing, of course, are the advertisements Microsoft makes and the sales force they have. And general administrative are things like their headquarters costs, legal costs, all kinds of things like that. CEO salary that goes into general administrative. You can see their operating margin is a little healthier than most companies. 25%. How about interest? Interest is usually interest in other income. Microsoft usually has positive interest income. It's interesting that they don't, no pun intended. Taxes. 
always like to look at the tax rate and see who's paying the most taxes. Microsoft is paying 15% taxes. How fair is that? You know, it'd be nice if I could pay 15% taxes. Or any of us, really, right? All right. You know, what's cool about finance is all of the lines are the same for every company, more or less. And the cool thing about Excel, oh, I know a lot of you have been asking for some like Excel shortcuts and stuff like that, so I'll teach you a little bit. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is that the Control key, the Shift key, the Alt key, those are your friends. Uh, when you combine them with other keystrokes, you can, for instance, Control left and right allow me to, just it just forwards you to the next cell. important. Control up down, same thing. And using the number pad on the right of your keyboard is very useful. So I'll occasionally give you some hints like that. But it, it doesn't matter if you do this in five minutes or 20 minutes, it doesn't make a difference. Understanding it is, is more important. Don't be confu don't confuse rapidity with understanding. Two very different things. So interesting to see that Microsoft, for instance, interesting to think, see that Microsoft's revenue declined. Their revenue declined. Yeah, this will be its own video uploaded to the site. So Microsoft's revenue declined 10%. Now remember, so did IBM's. And IBM explained to us that it was the currencies. It was the currency's fault. The euro fell so much that they had to have a decline in revenue. I'm sure Microsoft has a similar story. So we're going to have to keep our eye on that. We see that in pharmaceuticals as well. Every industry has been impacted. Every global company has been impacted by the euro's decline. So keep that in mind. All right, now we're gonna do something that we don't usually do. We're gonna put in the balance sheet while we, after we put in the income statement. So we're just gonna do cash, and cash, cash people, all of our classic balance sheet items. So let's see, 102,640 in cash. Well, we're gonna include investments. So it's gonna be uh, 11,514. All right, cool. Accounts receivable, this is cash that your customers owe you, delinquent customers. They're not delinquent, they're just, they just haven't paid you yet. Because you typically give your customers 30 days or so to pay you. And then the, the majestic property, plant, and equipment, they're very important. These are assets that are um, usable over, over one year time, usable in more than one year, very important property, plant, and equipment. We know that these are very difficult to account for sometimes. They cause all kinds of craziness for accountants. Goodwill and intangibles, we've talked about a little bit. So we're done with the asset side here. It's 180 billion in assets. Let's go to the liability side. 6936 for accounts payable. Here's the debt, 3750, uh, 4679. Accrued compensation. Taxes, deferred revenue. Lots of software companies have deferred revenue. We talked about deferred revenue as being cash that, uh, well, it's, it's, you've delivered, you've gotten paid, but you have not yet delivered the product. You have not yet delivered the product to the customer. And this happens quite a bit in software, believe it or not. It's crazy. Securities lending payable. 647. Deferred income taxes and other long term. I think we're done. Let's see if this equals $180 billion. Yes, it does. Try to try to move the keyboard a little bit. I'm sorry that it's so loud. They put it on my lap, that might help. Six four four seven. What's six four four seven? Other
So net cash is going to be our definition of cash minus their definition and our def de definition of debt. So you have 69 billion in cash. We, we're going to forecast their cash balance from here on out. So that's going to be pretty important. Here's their 10Q before this one. Same concept. This is, except this is the three months ended September 30th. And this is their 1Q. This is their 1Q. So this was their 10, this is their 2Q. I'm move all these over. Microsoft is kind of weird like that. I don't know why. In the old days, there were a lot of kind of companies that uh, had their calendar year end on 930. There's a lot of legacy reasons for that. So anyway, there's that. And we're just going to copy and paste everything, which makes our job a lot easier. very easy to just plug in once you have all the formulas. And again, I would encourage you to make your own models for companies that you're interested in. And you feel free to send them to me and I'll tell you if you did something right or wrong or if you have any questions, I'd be happy to look at them. I love looking at financial statements. It's my favorite thing. We'll be done with this in a GIF. Maybe I'll maybe I'll make it even faster if I do this. Hang on. Like I said, you really get a feel for the business when you when you do it like this. You really get uh, a great feel for the business that you wouldn't get if you just looked at a Bloomberg or Yahoo Finance, which would give you the shortcut. And you can't really use those shortcuts for other reasons. So we'll talk about that. Looks like Microsoft took on a bunch of debt. I know they bought Nokia's. They bought one of Nokia's businesses a little while back. That might have been why. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll investigate that later. balance sheet balance as well. Now, interesting thing about the cash flow statement. Cash flow statement, most companies report it, unlike the income statement, they report it on an accrual basis. I'll show you what that means. So let's go to the cash flow statement. Typically we do our model net income and report it on income. So we're gonna go up to model net income, which is four billion in this case. And the cash flow statement will tell us what they thought the net income was. In this case, it's exactly the same, it's 4620. Now we're going to do all the so-called addbacks, so-called addbacks that we did, we went over last time that kind of transform net income to another number. And in this case, they actually got 8 billion, almost double, 8.6 billion in cash generated from operations. Crazy, huh? Even though they reported net income on the income statement of 4.6 billion. One of the things to know about cash flow statements is that they reflect the reality that Business operations are smoothed out when you look at the net income line. The cash flow statement teaches you the 
the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sometimes it teaches you too much about how the cash moves on an annual basis. And there's some quarters in the business where you collect more cash, there's some quarters where you extend more cash. And that's a really important kind of concept. All right. So DNA is normally the biggest adjustment. Normally the biggest adjustment. Another one is stock based compensation. And then you can see here that they have this big swing in accounts receivable. They collected $6 billion of accounts receivable. That seems very unusual to me. That seems very unusual to me. They did, they did build inventory and other assets. So that partially neutralized it, but the total sum was a much larger cash flow from operations, much larger cash flow from operations than, than their net income. Now again, this, this I'm gonna show you my method for sort of smoothening that out and understanding, without, without looking at the income statement, understanding kind of real cash changes to a business. And I'll show you what I mean by this whole six month accrual thing. And this will be, if you're anything like me, this will be the bane of your existence for building models. All of this is very, very easy, on, on only except with the sole exception of this part. Now, thank God, Microsoft does this. They give you both lines. Most companies only give you the six months ended. So you actually have to sit there and subtract it out yourself. So thank God, Microsoft lets, is, is kind to us and, and lets us see the cash flow statement on a quarterly basis. Not every company does that. And I have to say, I really appreciate you guys watching. This is one of my favorite things to do. You give me a good reason to do it. I don't, you know, I've been on a little bit of a break from work and this is a ton of fun for me. So now you can see cash flow is greater than net income two quarters in a row. Two quarters in a row. And why is this important? Well, the average net income for these two quarters is $4.8 billion. The average net income for these two quarters, for the average free cash, or cash flow from operations for these two quarters, is $7 billion. That's a big, 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 big difference. Once again, $4.8 billion average net income for two quarters is a half a year. And here, it's, it's $7 billion. Well, if you told me you're going to make $28 billion in a year, 7 billion times 4, that's one number. If you told me it was 4.8 billion a year, that's a totally different number. And look at the valuation differences. The payback period or the earnings multiple is 12 times for one of them. And it's 17 times for another. I mean, if you told me I'd get my money back in 12 years for 17 years, I definitely would rather get it back in 12 years. And that's what Microsoft provides for you if you believe this number instead of this number. And which one's the true number? Well, that's the, the point of finance, is we're trying to find a good forecast. And this is the past. The past and the future aren't necessarily the same. So we have more work to do. We have a lot more work to do. Let's keep doing it. Microsoft's actually got a very good investor relations website, by the way. So let's see, here's an 8K. Can't believe Microsoft tried to get into phones. It's pretty embarrassing. I think it was Steve Ballmer's fault. All right, here's the Q4, which their Q4 ends in, is the June quarter, so it ends in June, July, August, last day of August. Does that make sense? No, it ends in June, <laughs> June 30th. So it's April, May, and June. That's their Q4. Pretty funky. All right, so let's do the math here. And you can see how easy it is when you have it side by side and how easy it is. Um, hmm. Now notice I'm, I'm excluding this impairment integration and restructuring because it's a non-cash charge. And I don't think they're gonna have that every quarter, so I don't really care if they had it that quarter. Now if they have lots of charges all the time, that's a different story. Let's do last year. 23, 382, 
like a video game, punching in these numbers. But there's a point to it. So now you can see the gross margin has declined. It was in the 60s, now it's 59. That's interesting. The rest of the operating margin has declined too. And meanwhile, it's not because low quality revenue has been added. Revenue has been declining as well. So it's a little bizarre. It's a little bizarre. Net cash went down by three billion here. Let's see. Even though they're they're profitable to the tune of four four or five billion, let's add another month that our quarter of balance sheet. Let's see what happens. See, the debt has gone up by about $10 billion. I wonder what they spent that money on. Maybe dividends and buybacks and things like this. sheet balances quite well. Now because they do this cash flow statement, I would like to add it in here. Uh, cash flow statement. I don't know where they start in net income. Oh, here we go. All right, so their reported net income is minus minus 31.95. So, let's see goodwill and asset impairments. That's the first line. Impairments. We're going to reconcile that minus 31.95. That's going to be most of it. Or no, 70. Reported net income minus 31.95. 74.98. Three depreciation. SBC. And you can see here they extended a lot of credit to their customers. So it looks like the end of their fiscal year they extend a lot of credit. Or at least, or maybe there's no there's no trend to it. It just goes up and down. Here they collected all their receivables. Here they extended. Here they collected. There's no necessarily no rhyme or reason. Sometimes things are just random. You can't tell for sure what when your customers will pay you and when they won't, unless you have my team. All right. So here's the third quarter in the row. Third quarter in the row where their cash flow, where their cash flow is greater than their net income. So again, the average being five billion for net income and seven billion quarterly cash flow for cash flow. That is a big difference. And again, we're dealing with that seven billion number. We're on track to make 28 billion a year, which is close to 10 times earnings, which is pretty cheap. That's pretty cheap. Even though Microsoft is thought to be kind of a laggard in many ways, that is a very cheap uh, relative to some of the other companies we've looked at. Although, Although, look at Apple. Apple's eight times. So let's do let's do this. Twenty-eight billion is what we think twenty sixteen earnings are. And without even building a model, let's assume let's assume that it declines by one percent. So, according to this, pound for pound, Apple's the cheapest, Microsoft's the second cheapest, and IBM's the third cheapest. But that doesn't mean they're the most attractive in that order. We don't know if Apple. Apple's earnings will fall off a cliff. A lot of people think they will. We don't know if IBM's earnings will fall off a cliff. They certainly haven't been doing a good job. And we don't know anything about Microsoft because we just started to look at it. We just started to look at it. So let's keep doing that. We've got three quarters in our books. Let's do the last one. Sometimes you don't know everything about a business from your personal experience with it, unless you're in the software industry. Even, even if you are, it's not easy to know what a company, how they're really making their money all the time. So I would throw away any thoughts you have about Microsoft when you do this. You have to be completely objective. 
And that's hard for a lot of people. They say, ew, Microsoft. No, you can't think that way. It's not a beauty contest. It's about bargains. You're trying to get the best bargain, not the best company. If you wanted the best company, you have to pay the highest price. And that may not be a bargain. You may be overpaying. You still may be getting a bargain. It's not really clear. Uh, but you know, it's not about a beauty contest. We're not movie critics. We're bargain hunters. And that's one of the, that's, if, I, if people, if someone asked me what the number one thing people don't understand in finance, it's that. We're not trying to make a, a good or bad uh, kind of uh, rating. We're trying to make, are we getting our money's worth rating? It's just a very different analysis oftentimes, especially in companies like this. In pharma and biotech, it's a little more complicated, but certainly in this kind of, it still applies, don't mind you, uh, mind you. But uh, it's, it's, it's uh, extremely important for companies like this. Good versus bad is not the calculation we're making. We're, we're weighing exactly what is this, it's like, it's like 50 different diamonds. There's definitely one better diamond than the other. But we're trying to figure out is which diamond is the best bargain we can buy for the cheapest price. Of course, plugging and chugging, as we like to say, these numbers is a bit boring, but it's almost done. said 5 billion they said it's a little less they said 5.2 they say 5 exactly no impairments this quarter the DNA all this stuff looks pretty normal not a lot of swings I will say their accounts receivable swing more than I've ever seen any other company swing I wonder why that is there we go. And here, look at this. Massively larger cash flow from operations. Massively larger. Massively larger. How about CapEx? I haven't been watching CapEx. Let's take a look at CapEx. I don't think cash flow from financing is that important, but let's look at CapEx. CapEx is additions to property and equipment in this case, 1391. So free cash flow, we have to subtract out these two, right? That's one of the reasons why cash flow is larger than net income. Could be because of CapEx. You don't think a software company is having a lot of CapEx. I mean, after all, they don't have any equipment to make the software. I mean, come on. Software. Let's also look for acquisitions. Acquisitions. That's a, another interesting thing to, to watch. Acquisitions and buybacks. So for acquisitions, they had 162 million. And here for buybacks, they had negative five, three, six, another five billion. We kind of trace where all their cash went. It's very important. Let's go back to the other uh, cash flow statement just to see what their capex, what their capex was. their buybacks. Let's look at that. Acquisitions, 626. How about CapEx? 1781. All right, so now it's starting to look a little closer. You know, this quarter was still 3 billion more than this quarter. This quarter was actually below. Free cash flow is below net income. Look at this one. I'm going to show you my method for kind of smoothing these things out. It's not that complicated. You can even probably guess what it is. Oops. 
Microsoft hasn't really been acquiring a lot of things. There's buybacks, common stock. Also dividends. Make sure I didn't miss dividends some other quarter, but YOLO. And here's the last one. So here's the free cash flow. What I'd like to do is sum it on a, on a trailing basis. That's my advanced method here. It's 12 month free cash flow. Now if I do that with 12 month net income, you can kind of see which one is which, which one is higher than the other. In this case, you can see it's about 4 billion higher. It's about 4 billion higher. So which one is the real number? Well, it's hard to tell. It's, it's probably free cash flow. It's probably free cash flow. So let's let's assume in our forecasting that they're not going to make 28 billion. They're going to make 24 billion. So now Microsoft is, at least by an earnings ratio perspective, the most quote unquote expensive company. But could it, it could have the highest growth potential? Who knows? We haven't looked at the business yet. I mean, if taking a look at their last four quarters. They haven't been growing very much. But now again, that might be due to the euro. We don't, we're not sure. We gotta look into that. I just wanna make sure there weren't dividends I'm missing. I hate missing things. Let's, let's go to one more time. Dividends, there we go, 2496. Okay, so we can see that Microsoft's been kind of struggling with their revenue growth, but let's let's look at let's go to their website. Um, MSFT used to be their website, I guess uh, it's not anymore for their uh, for their for their investor relations. But if we go here, it's always somewhere on the bottom. There it is, investor relations, Microsoft.com forward slash investor, and it's right here. Material uh, Microsoft Cloud. Strength highlights the second quarter results, and here's their new CEO. Go here. They had non-GAAP revenue that was higher than GAAP revenue. That's kind of bizarre, isn't it? So we're going to make some GAAP adjustments, and that could also, by the way, be sometimes the difference between net income and cash flow. Let's see if we can look into some of their growth. Some of their growth. Businesses everywhere are using the Microsoft Cloud as their digital platform to drive their ambitious transformation agendas, says Satya Nadella. Now, where have we heard that before, class? Businesses everywhere are using the blank cloud as their digital platform to drive their ambitious transformation agendas. Where who's smart? Who can tell us? Who can tell us where we've heard that before? Yeah, IBM. Very good, Mr. Koopsta. I'm going to make you a moderator. Don't let me down. Don't let me down. Congratulations. Um, yeah, IBM said the same crap. <laughs> IBM said the same crap. Uh, uh, the last press release we read, everyone's talking about how their cloud... Sorry, I have to get high. Everyone's talking about how their cloud is, uh, their cloud business is growing. I'm just kidding, this is a saline solution. Sometimes my nose gets clogged. You can always, uh, you can always email me at Shkreli, it's uh, shkrelimartin at gmail.com. And uh, 
certainly if you're a moderator, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch I'm gonna watch you your models first. Anyway, so yeah, everyone's talking about how the cloud is 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 the only way they're growing. But you know, the problem is if you are not growing, and that number, last I checked, I don't need glasses, it's negative. So don't give me that BS. Businesses everywhere are using Microsoft Cloud as their digital platform to drive their ambitious transformation agendas. Man, if one of my executives said, look at this great thing that we're doing that drives, drives business agendas. We went from 26 billion to 24 billion. Bruh, bruh, come on, bruh. How about an apology? All right. Now here's, of course, where they're, where they blame it. Uh, they blame it on the currency. So let's see what their revenue would have grown without, without the currency change. Here it is. Let's say it would have grown three percent. Percent change year over year, non-GAAP constant currency. We have to make two or three different adjustments to it as reported versus non-GAAP, and then we have to make a currency transformation. It's a lot, of, a lot of headaches, but you know what? I believe them. I don't always believe them. Local currency is year over year plus 3%. Now, IBM, 3% growth isn't anything to write home about, but it's growth, at least. It's growth. Now, IBM was giving us the same spiel, but even after adjusting for currencies, they shrank by 2%. But if we've learned anything, we know that even a couple percentage points change, changes value by a lot. Minus 3% of maturity makes IBM a lot less attractive than, than minus one, for instance. So there's a lot of things that, little things like that that make a difference. All right, let's go back to Microsoft. All right, so I guess they're in the cloud business as well. But let's let's go back to my method, which is I, I like to read every press release. I like to read every press release. Where do I where do I like where can I do that? Home. All announcements and there's ways to subscribe. Let me let me subscribe. Let me subscribe. Email alerts. I want all releases. All SEC files. All events and webcasts. Huh. Alright, here's the here's the alerts if you want alerts. Martin Shkreli, Shkreli Martin at gmail.com. Three O one six O. There we go. Alright. Let's go back. So I want all press releases. They're making it a little harder than most. Usually you can just click press releases. Pain in the neck. Well, let's read this release as, uh, at, at the very least from start to finish. Commercial cloud annualized revenue run rate exceeds 9.4 billion, Windows 10 active on over 200 million devices. So I'm gonna write that down in this model. Windows 10 installed base. They're saying it's 200 million. Might as well track that. And you can always ask Microsoft, you say, hey, how's your, where's your Windows installed base? If they, they stop telling you, you know it's bad. A good trick as a professional investor at least we delivered double digit operating income growth bit revenue in productivity and business processes declined two percent and was up five percent with the following highlights, office, office grew, and office 365 grew by 70%, wow. 
Office 365 consumer subscribers grew to 20.6 million. Wow. This is called Office 365. It's one of their Microsoft Office. I think I'm using it as we speak. Let's see. So they have this productivity, productivity and business processes, business segment. We call that segment. And what's the percentage of revenue? What's the percentage of revenue? It was 6.7 billion out of um, 25 billion, 25.6 billion. So what is that? 6.7 divided by 25.6 is 27% of their business is office. So what's in that business segment? I guess we can write just contains office. So 26% of Microsoft is office. I bet you didn't know that. I bet you didn't know that because you're a noob. Noob, N-O-O-B. There we go. All right, Intelligent Cloud. That's their next business segment. Intelligent Cloud. And that is five, mm, 6.3 billion. 6.3 billion. That was up 11%. 6.3 over 25.6. That's another 24%. I don't know anything about their Intelligent Cloud business. Oh, there it is. Azure. I've heard of Azure. I don't know a lot about it. Azure. They must be doing very well with Azure. I mean, it used to be, by the way, that, that Office was about half of Microsoft. Now it's down to a quarter. That's good. That's good. So we'll learn all about Azure. I'm curious what that is. We're going to have to learn a lot about it. I'm not a technologist, but I'm willing to learn. Server products and cloud services, Azure, server products, cloud services. All right, more, more personal computing, not even personal computing, more personal computing. It's kind of a silly name, isn't it? And this was 12.7 billion. So this is still their biggest business. And this is, that's 50% of their business. So you can think of Microsoft in, in three parts. Personal computing, which is Windows, right? Windows. And that's the, that's the only business that's declining. Not a surprise, right? Growth, minus 2%. Intelligent Cloud, up 11%. Productivity, up 5%. So personal computing is kind of the legacy, we like to say legacy business. And that has Windows, probably Xbox. And Xbox is at Xbox Monthly is at 48 million people. Holy moly. Xbox Live, right? Search. So that's Bing, I'm guessing. Windows 10 probably. Phone revenue down 50%. I think they stopped selling phones. Surface, Surface. Who has a Surface? All right, so those are Microsoft's kind of core products. We might as well write their competition down, just so we kind of know. This isn't a good, this is always a great thing to keep track of, but why not? So I don't know who competes with Azure. Let's, what is Azure? Let's see. Azure. Microsoft Azure. It's a cloud computing platform and services. Open, flexible, enterprise-grade cloud computing platform. Move faster, do more, and save money with IAAS and PAAS. I wonder what that is. All right, let's just look at the Wikipedia. PAAS, Platform as a Service. IAAS, Infrastructure as a Service. So this is probably a lot like AWS. Office is competing with, I think, Google Spreadsheets, OpenOffice. Oh, what, what what's Microsoft Dynamics? Let's see. It's a CRM? Oh, cool. 
I didn't know Microsoft had a CRM. That's competing with Oracle, right? Oracle and SAP. Cool. And certainly uh, their competitor for personal computing is Apple, certainly Sony with PlayStation. Uh, who else with phones? Samsung, right? A few, a few competitors. Cool. So now we're gonna we're gonna what we've historically done is just track revenue, and I think we want to go a step further. We want to actually track the segments. Here it is. Productivity, which is office, cloud, and PC. We actually want to start tracking these too. is PC revenue is probably going to decline forever. It's only declining a few percent a year, but it's still painful. So we can kind of forecast based on each segment. So instead of forecasting off of revenue, we can actually just do like this, equals sum, like that. And we can, I'll show you kind of what, what the game plan is in a second. Cool how they give these out, but I still want to read the press releases. Here we go. Here's the Q1. I remember what I said about reading a year of press releases and putting all the information there. I want to see what the local currency was this quarter. It's always interesting to see the quotes. We are making strong progress, of course, uh, across each of our three ambitions by delivering innovation, people, and love. What? First of all, there's some typos here. Innovation, people, and love? Are you serious? Is this the same Microsoft? Is this the same Microsoft? That doesn't sound right to me. Oh, innovation people love, like the innovation that people love. By delivering innovation that people love. I get it. Customer excitement for new devices, Windows 10, Office 365, and Azure is increasing as we bring together the best Microsoft experiences to empower people and achieve more. Okay. So let's see, up four, up 14. Wow, look at that, look at that. Revenue in more personal computing declined 13%, 13% in constant currency. Wow, that's terrible. Anytime something's declining by 13%, I'm gonna make a note of that. Minus 13% constant currency. Wow. What a what a terrible quarter. PCs are gonna just drag on, on Windows revenue is just gonna drag. I'm gonna say 39 million Xbox Live users that quarter. They really go from 39 to 48? That sounds like a 
unrealistic. Maybe because of the Christmas season. That's bizarre. Office 365, 18 million users of a Windows 10. Maybe they don't give that out nearly as much. Yeah, I don't see uh, Windows ever kind of uh, growing again, right? That's in a permanent decline, Windows. Here it is again, down. Oh, they, they, they used to have different segments. Look at that. They changed their segments. Changed everything. Phone hardware revenue. Look at this. Segment information, devices and consumer. Huh. And this gives us a clue as to how big each of these businesses were. Look at this. Computing and gaming. Surface revenue increased to a billion dollars. Huh. Xbox is about a billion dollars a quarter as well. Hmm. Here it is. This is their old segment revenue. Now they only disclosed three. Now they only disclose three revenue lines. Look at that. It's pretty interesting. I'm gonna put those in here too. Devices and consumer licensing. These are pretty nondescript. I wonder what these are. You can see the huge decline. 34% decline. How about computing and gaming hardware? It's probably Xbox. I'm sure the Surface is fine. Phone hardware. That's easy. They kind of decided to get out of phones, I think. They, they tried their best, didn't, didn't make sense. Devices and consumer other. That's probably the surface, I think. It's kind of hard to tell. This must be Windows, commercial licensing. Commercial other. So this gives you a better picture when they only have three business lines, it's all kind of cloudy, but I think they don't want to show these embarrassed, some of these growth rates are pretty embarrassing. 34% I mean, decline, and look how much more volatile they are than these growth rates, which are very kind of staid. Six, eight, uh, 35, eight, uh, wait, wait, these are, they're doing these quarterly, let me do these an annually is the only way to look at them, of course. Negative 2, 5, and negative 5 compared to these, which are down 34%, up 44%, down 38%, up 31%, minus 7%, up 36%. You know, all over the map. So let's see. Devices and consumer. Devices and consumer licensing. Commercial licensing is office. So devices and consumer licensing is Windows. This is so confusing. Maybe we leave it off here. We did we made a pretty nice model. So we can always go back to Microsoft later. We did an hour and a half on Microsoft. Let's Let's try Facebook. 
Remember, our job is to sort of look at these cash flows. Maybe, maybe we'll do real quick on Microsoft, we'll do the long-term cash flow. So let's see, margins, revenue, shares. Let's keep their tax rate at their kind of average tax rate for the last four quarters, which is 19%. Zero with respect to interest. Keep their margins. And let's see, maybe they're a little bit below their average, say 63%. Okay. So now how about forecasting revenue? This has been declining at 2%. This has been growing each at 5%. So revenue on constant currency is growing 3%. But how are the Euro, how's the Euro moved year over year? I think it's starting to flatten out. So let's, let's try this. Let's try this times 0.01%. Now let's build out our, our annuals. Remember, the fourth quarter of 2016 happens in 630, 2016. So just keep that in mind. And these are necessarily kind of un, not too useful in terms of for, I wouldn't say they're not, they're not that helpful in terms of forecasting, but that's okay. They're not totally worthless, as we'll see in a second. Pick a revenue growth rate for Microsoft. I mean, they seem more dynamic than other companies. I mean, Azure came out of nowhere to save the day, right? Let's imagine that they would grow 1% a year. Let's see if that's reasonable. How about gross margins? This is my method. It's kind of a, the, the most introspective method that I've seen in terms of trying to see what the market's thinking as well as what you're thinking. So margins of 63% in perpetuity seem aggressive. We talk about how margins reflect return on equity in metrics like this. Someday that's gonna be a good lesson. There's some theories that companies shouldn't have excess margins. All right, let's look at net cash as well. So Microsoft's cash profile will look something like this. We know we like to forecast cash and interest income based on yield. We call that what ROIC. Let's put in a placeholder of one percent. The company should be able to generate one percent cash, right? One percent returns. That's not too much to ask. Taxes are going to leave at nineteen percent. Let's make it twenty percent. So we've got a rudimentary forecast for Microsoft. How about discount rate? I like the I like the fact that they're so diversified. I mean, my, even they're more diversified than IBM. I mean, IBM is just a consulting, big fat consulting company. Microsoft has so many different products. I didn't know that. How about maturity? Let's assume they decline in maturity. I never like to assume companies grow in perpetuity. That seems like a 
mistake to me. The new CEO of Microsoft seems really good. I'm going to be racist and just call him the Indian guy. Probably is not a good way to think of him, but. I have to add back, I'm not going to discount the 2016 earnings or 2017 earnings since we're getting those right away. It's a bug in Excel. And then the cash itself, Satya. Alright, so the cash itself, we get a value of 600 billion, which you know is a lot higher than the current stock price. So to me, of the three companies we've looked at thus far, I like Microsoft the most. I see, well, let's see. $78 a share. So it's $600 billion instead of $400 billion. So $78 instead of $51. That's a pretty good, it's 50% above where it's trading at. So both, both Microsoft and IBM seem like pretty good opportunities, even with conservative, pretty conservative estimates. But they're also in some ways somewhat fairly valued. That's a big discount, 55%, but I don't really know what the future may bring. Most of these tech giants inevitably crumble. And if they started to crumble, we could do the kind of reverse. This is, this is what would have to happen. They'd have to drop 1% a year virtually in perpetuity at a discount rate of just 4%, which is, is for a tech company, even though they're diverse, is a little bit a little bit outlandishly low. They're only generating 1% return. I and mean, we know they do a little better than that, just to the sheer number of buybacks of things they do. So in some ways, Microsoft is fairly valued if they never grow again or shrink a little bit. If they grow a little bit, it doesn't take much. 3% a year would be more than enough then the stock could be a double. So it's all about, do you think Microsoft can grow? And the fact that they have this albatross with Windows, although Windows isn't as big as it looks, it's not 50%. I think that Windows is less than that, but it's declining faster than the group. So anyway, there's a lot, there's a lot of little things that we have to look at there. I, I wonder, I've been wondering about Facebook, so maybe let's do Facebook for the next half hour Let's do it for half an hour and see what we learn, if anything. Not, not much to learn in half an hour, but maybe we get some basics. Get some basics. One share of Facebook is $105. Wow. I remember when that went public for like $30. It was a little while ago, to be fair. Facebook ticker is just FB. That's like my ticker would be FU. All right, enough of that. 2.2 billion shares of class A stock and 551 million shares of class B stock. Their market cap is 300 billion. 2846. 2846. And you'll see something very interesting. Very interesting from Facebook. The filing whisperer. I like that. I do like my SEC filings. Looks like Facebook doesn't break out. All their, their whole annual statement is in one form 10K. I like that. Look how much, look, look how little cash Facebook has compared to these other guys. It's like they're a startup. They don't have any debt. That's the first time we've seen something like this. No debt. Pretty interesting, huh? 
Wait till you see the cash flow, though. That'll really surprise you. So very little cash, very little, no debt, literally no debt. <clears throat> so 18,434 in net cash. So look at that. Facebook is as almost as big as Microsoft. One business is what 30 years old, 40 years old. One business is 10 years old. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Literally breathtaking. Of course, I think Facebook's a short, but you know. Well, it's it's up to them as to whether they have, they want debt or not. I mean, Microsoft could have no debt too, but Facebook isn't a creative financial company. They just kind of focus on growth. Once you're old, once you're an old company, you tend to take debt on because you have a reliable business. Facebook's not quite there yet. All right, let's just look at the queue. Facebook Inc. All right, you can see their revenue is a lot lower than what we're used to. I mean, Microsoft's revenue last quarter was 22, $23 billion, right? Let's just go back, get that right, about 20, $23 billion, right? $24 billion. Look what Facebook's revenue last quarter was. Is this a joke? Four and a half billion dollars? How could they be worth the same amount? Does anyone know? Who's the smart aleck that knows? I mean, Microsoft literally has five times as much revenue. And look at the net income. It has nothing to do with margins. They not, didn't even make a billion dollars last quarter. They didn't even make a billion dollars last quarter. Microsoft made 10 billion, 5 billion last quarter. So Microsoft is making five times as much money as Facebook, but Facebook is worth the same amount. How is it possible? How is it possible? It is about growth. Akil is already a mod, so there's no way for me to mod him again. He's a super mod. Um, it's one word answer, growth. Essa did a good job, Nathaniel Flack, and uh, let's see, I like this answer, which is it's overvalued. <laughs> That's definitely true too. Scully the Great, Robert B, all of these were good answers. Maybe they shouldn't be worth the same, I like that, exactly. It's definitely not split shares. It's not a user base, it's growth, it's growth. The hope is that one day, one day, they'll have more earnings, just as much or more earnings than Microsoft. Just as much isn't good enough, because why would I want just as much five or 10 years from now? I need more. So let's, let's look at that, let's look at that. So we see these tech giants. Let's, let's actually look at, <clears throat> let's make a column. 2016 revenue growth. Let's abbreviate that, I guess, RG. And let's pop all this in here. So Apple, 2016 revenue growth, we're estimating minus 2%. They've gotten so damn big, they can't grow anymore. Whoever thought we would say that about Apple? How about Microsoft? We're estimating 3%. No, no, 1%. 1%. Okay. How about IBM? I think we're estimating it to go down. Minus two, or nope, minus one. Okay, so Facebook last quarter grew revenue by 30%, something like that, quite a bit, quite a bit. So the theory is that they haven't monetized their platform as much as they can, and they will someday. Let's look at revenue growth. They're growing revenue way more than anyone. 40% revenue growth. Yeah, the models are all saved on the share drive. Still, I must admit that I think it's overvalued.
Let's look at clogs. Gross profit, gross margin. Research and development is their biggest cost. They probably don't even need to do any. That's another reason. We'll talk about that in a second. Actually, this will be a really good example. A really good example. Too much in taxes. Look at that. They pay. It looks. It looks like they actually pay normal taxes. They don't do any tax dodging. That's insane. What's wrong with them? That'll change once they become a bigger business. Look at that. Who pays thirty-seven percent taxes? Get out of here with that. Gross margin is eighty-four percent. They still can't believe they pay all that tax. Hasn't anyone told Mark Zuckerberg you don't need to pay taxes? Why is he, why is he following the rules? This is crazy. This is crazy. Thirty-seven percent tax rate. Get out of here. Forty percent tax rate. Oh my God. All right. So let me show you. Let me show you why this is interesting. I'm gonna do something cool. This will be a great way to end the lesson. First, I'm gonna add a couple more quarters. So I can't do it without a little more data. I'm only gonna I'm gonna focus almost exclusively on the income statement. And this, if I do this right, it should blow your mind. If I do this wrong, which I probably will, you'll just be confused. You'll probably just be confused. It's interesting, though. A wrench thrown into my plans here. I want to adjust GAAP and non-GAAP because they, they have this big stock-based comp expenditure. It's interesting, I think they have some Oculus, it's this weird deal with the, the Oculus guys that kind of screws their numbers up. It's pretty fascinating. So Facebook maybe is making a billion and a half quarter. It's still far less than Microsoft's five or six billion, right? They have to triple their income to even get to Microsoft's level. And even then, Microsoft will be far more diverse than Facebook. It seems really unlikely that Facebook could possibly be, be valuable, be this valuable. But let's, let's keep working. Work, 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 work.
percent. So you can see the crazy revenue growth, right? 40%, 40%, 40%. Companies like this are very hard to value, and Wall Street always gets it wrong. There's a reason. There's a reason. It's a little bit loco. I'm going to do my best to explain it. If we go a little over 10 o'clock, so be it. High, super high growth companies are very hard to value. I know how to value them, believe it or not. I'm going to share some secrets here. Look at the quarter they had. Five billion in revenue. They possibly even grew faster than this. It's crazy. They went from 40% growth to 50% growth. Usually growth slows down as you get bigger. Growth is only accelerating at Facebook. Totally nuts, huh? Oh, look at that. Their R&D... Oh, no, it's still there. It's still there. 18. Okay, so now they're up to 2.3 billion in net income. So now they're only about half of Microsoft. They're growing 50% a year. So how the heck do we figure out a forecast here? It's, it's actually remarkably different from any other way. And you can't just do a placeholder. You can't do a placeholder and say, yeah, it's about right. So if we do something like this, we say, all right, let's say they just grow 40% a year. That's a really inaccurate way it's an extremely inaccurate way. And you should only, you should never even feel that comfortable doing it, but only when you're dealing with constant growth rates could you even feel remotely comfortable, remotely comfortable doing that. So, so we'll sort of do it like that for a second. But we'll see that if they continue growing at this pace, within a few quarters, within a few quarters, they'll be, they'll be sort of earning not quite five billion, but they'll be up to four billion be up to four billion, four billion a quarter. And if they cut down their research expenses, which they could probably do pretty easily, they could they could be as profitable as Microsoft. And all it would take is one more year of this level of growth. Right? So another 40% growth year. And they'd have, if they did that, even if they slow down a 30% growth, you'll see that their income would maybe even exceed Microsoft's. But that's not how you value or, or watch growth companies like this. I'll show you how I would do it. It's quite different. They could have 23 billion in earnings in 2019, which is just as much as Microsoft. But that's also assuming they grow like a weed. And they seem to be growing like a weed. It doesn't seem like that'll stop. They have WhatsApp, they've got Oculus, they've got Facebook. And we're also assuming that they slow down too. And they could monetize their platform a lot more easily than maybe, than maybe is suggested. So how the heck do we forecast revenue for a situation like this? It's very, very difficult. I actually think this is prob probably one of the least done and best, I won't say best kept secrets on Wall Street, but it's, it's at least my method isn't, 
it's not well taught. Um, so let me let me do that in a second. I have to use the restroom, so I might, this might be an abridged version. But in essence, we have to sort of think about monetization of user bases. So what we want to know is what is Facebook's user base and how much money are they making per user? And I, th I don't think that's that hard to figure out. So what we'll do is we'll go to Facebook. Well, I won't go to my Facebook. Let's go to Facebook Investor Relations. Facebook Investor Relations. That's investor.facebook.com. Here it is. Financial press releases. Here we go. Reports fourth quarter results. They just did that. Okay. You can see all of their revenue is from advertising. 5.6 billion, virtually every dime. Here it is. Daily active users. Daily active users, 1.04 billion. And you can see their, their, the growth of that was only 17%. Daily active users. DAUs. So if you take revenue divided by daily active users, they're making $5 per quarter on their daily active users. Five bucks, that's per quarter. So annually, Facebook makes 22 bucks off of you. Pretty, makes you feel kind of cheap, huh? 22 bucks. And what does it cost? What does it cost to have cable? What does it cost to have cable? Well, it's more than 20 bucks a year. It's probably what, $1,000 a year, more? And you probably, you probably would rather give up Facebook than cable, or cable than Facebook, I should say. They're pretty close. Think about the value you receive in life. The value you receive in life from the things you like. Facebook makes you pay, you know, basically asking you to pay $22.60. Cable, cell phone. In fact, a lot of people, the only reason we have cell phones is to go on Facebook, right? So if you think about this, Facebook is quite a good value. You don't pay for it, you pay for it by clicking some, watching some ads, right? So cable's what, $100 a month, right? Is cable about $100 a month? So it's about $1,200 a year, is that about right? Maybe more? What other things do we, do we, what's your cell phone bill, roughly? It's $5 per quarter. Cable's 30 a month for some of you guys. Your cell phone's 50. So Facebook was, was asking you to pay more. and they just charged you through through ads, I think they could probably get that pricing through. We'll talk about this in a second. What's interesting is you can see that the growth in their users is less than their revenue growth. The revenue growth is 52%. The user growth is 17%. What does that mean? What does that mean? What can we infer from this? Average revenue per user. What does it mean? Yeah, they're charging more per user. Exactly. You can see the ARPU grew. Average revenue per user grew. Thirty percent. So the fifty-two percent of revenue. Most of it was actually coming from price increases in many ways. They're selling more ads per user, showing more ads, charging more for ads, whatever it might be. Pricing power is very important in business. I'm probably the one person that can 
talk to you about that more than anyone. You always want to charge more for, to your customers if you can, if you can, all else being equal. And there's probably some limit on ARPU. There's no limit on users. Well, they have a billion of them at least. So they need to get more and more. They need to get better and better at getting more and more money out of users. Exactly. And we should always think about how much are we really willing to pay to Facebook? What's Netflix? What's Netflix per month? How much is it per month? 10 bucks per month? Is that about right? 10 bucks a month, Netflix? So Facebook is still a sixth, a sixth of what Netflix costs in some ways. It almost feels like for Facebook that we should uh, get it for free, right? It's just a, a way to think about it. So let's say, for argument's sake, this is going to be a little bit of a crazy analysis. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to forecast using that just by saying, well, dur, let me, let me multiply this by forty percent, and then thirty percent, and then twenty percent. That's a really dumb, dumb way to forecast anything. Let me instead say, Facebook's not going to change a lot in eight average users. You know, I think more or less that'll stay the same. More or less that'll stay the same. User growth will start to slow down. There's only so many people who want to be on Facebook, right? The ARPU, the average revenue per user, let's say that that works its way up to the same amount that Netflix charges us per year. Remember, this is per year. This is times four. So Netflix is about $120 a year. Say by 2019, Facebook is taking out from your pocket, in, in essence, $120, which is the same amount that Netflix takes out of your pocket. Is that apples, a good apples to apples comparison? I mean, Netflix lets you watch, what, movies, TV shows, unique content. Facebook is giving you unique content in another way. It lets you stay in touch with people. It's both pretty important. I think it's decent. I think it's decent. We have a billion users, except instead of paying you, I'm gonna drive revenue with this. And I get 128 billion. I get 128 billion. And here, they're making $70 billion. $70 billion. Do you think Netflix offers more comparison? I know they're different business models. They're definitely different business models. But the question is, which is more valuable? It's not crazy. It's not crazy. So let's say that's the case. And then let's say it starts to decline because you know, all good things come to an end. Between then and 2030, it kind of declines. Maybe 5% a year, I don't know. value of this is. I'm going to put a really high discount rate, 8%. They're not going to charge users, but the point is they're monetizing the users. So if they can collect as much as Netflix collects out of their users, and then they decline from there, let's say they decline less fast, because I have them declining like a really fast. I'm gonna say hold that for a while. 
Well, the value of Facebook would be 600 or $700 billion, which is way more than their current share price. And I'm not including, of course, anything. It's about double their current share price. I'm not including anything for kind of um, Oculus. Maybe a little bit of WhatsApp is in here, like these users, do they include WhatsApp or not? And how much can they monetize their users? Um, it's, it's unclear. And the question is, how much ads can the internet really sell? How much ads can the, the internet really sell? Um, you know, Google is competing with Facebook. Unless all ads go to the internet, there has to be some pressure for, for advertising as well. And we have to make a big, broad advertising model as well. But the point is that we don't just use the law of larger numbers, which is a temptation that I think we fall into quite a bit. The smarter thing to do is to try to, try to use things like users and, and, and dollars per users to try to drive revenue and, and get a more sophisticated understanding of, uh, of how to uh, forecast revenue accurately. So we see you have mobile users, monthly active users is 1.6 billion. I think monthly average, monthly active users are not nearly as valuable as dailies, obviously. I don't think they give out many other numbers like WhatsApp or, or what have you. But it's still a pretty interesting way to kind of forecast. And again, this is the first time we take our revenue as a function of two other variables. In the past, we've taken revenue as a function of last year's revenue multiplied by some other number. So there's a lot more we can do here. And again, I don't know that they can get, let's say they get to half of Netflix's half of where Netflix is at in terms of customer monetization. But then they grow with just plain old inflation. This is still a business that will grow quite a bit faster than, than where they're at. Or the stock is, is actually very cheap. So it's possible that Facebook is actually the cheapest stock of all, even though the EV to earnings, EV to earnings is wildly higher Look at the EV to earnings. The EV to earnings is 28 times. But if you look at 2017 earnings, it starts to look much more reasonable. It's only 19 times earnings. So Facebook might actually be the cheapest stock of them all. And revenue growth is not even close. It's 40% compared to 1%, 2% for these other guys. So it actually could be the cheapest stock of them all. I kind of like Facebook the most out of all of this. I like IBM, probably, and Apple probably the least. So I like Microsoft and Facebook. I don't like Apple and IBM. But we'll do some stock picking later. We'll actually use some real money, and maybe we'll buy, you know, ten thousand dollars worth of each of these or something like that, and see if our portfolio does does okay. Anyway, I've had a long day. I've taught back to back classes for the last five hours or so, with a break in between. So I'm going to call it a night. I hope you learned something and. Uh, I'll plan out a nice lesson plan for our next lesson. So thank you so much for joining me. Talk to you all soon.